Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a marvelous film. Oh, thank you. Could you please tell us about the relationship between Francis Perkins and Eleanor Roosevelt? You, he, he would be the man to talk about that. Uh, Chris was the president of the uh, uh, Hyde Park FDR Museum and Library and knows more about Eleanor Roosevelt than I do, so what do you think? Well, no one's ever done a book on that topic, and it, it, it really deserves to be done. Uh, they were close from the days of the governorship of Roosevelt in Albany. Um, Eleanor worked to get Francis appointed Secretary of Labor. Uh, she worked <clears throat> to get her into the governor's administration under Frank, Frank and Roosevelt, and she was the only person from the Al Smith entourage that was a continuous figure uh, through the Roosevelt governorship and presidency. And since so she starts with Theodore Roosevelt, she is the continuity from the progressive Bull Moose days right through to 1945. In 1940, if you've read Doris Kearns Goodwin, No Ordinary Time, uh, the 40 Convention, which has been honored in about three major books in the last couple of years, uh, probably the most fateful election since 1860, uh, Roosevelt was determined not to go to Chicago. And he hadn't even announced that he'd be a candidate for re-election but he'd taken the oxygen out of the room for any other candidate. And Francis was at the, Chicago, at the convention, and as she'd done in 1932, she said, you, you should come out to the convention, which Roosevelt did, the first candidate of a major party for president to visit the convention, 1932. He flew out, which is very dramatic, given his polio demonstrated his, his vigor. <laughs> and, um, Francis said in 1940, you've got to come out here. He said, I'm not coming out. She said, well, then Eleanor should come out. He said, well, you'll have to ask her. I can't ask her. <laughs> so again, as Eleanor and Francis frequently did with each other, um, she, Francis calls Eleanor. And Eleanor says, I won't go unless he asks me. <laughs> so he asked her, and she goes out and gives the... Uh, speech, these are no ordinary times, and brought the convention under control. And the other factor that she, Eleanor, and Franklin insisted on was that Henry Wallace be made the vice president. The relationship, I don't think, my, my sense of it is not that they never were intimate friends, but they were real friends. And they you know, they were in different relations to this great man. Uh, when Eleanor would have all the wives of the cabinet to tea, she expected Francis to be there. Well, Francis was a cabinet member. She wasn't a spouse. And I know that that was a, a little issue. I happened a couple of weeks before Mrs. Roosevelt died, and by the way, it was always Mrs. Roosevelt, for us to talk about Eleanor and Francis is totally out of keeping with the times. Um, and she told me she was going to see Mrs. Roosevelt at Mrs. Roosevelt's request. And she was dying here in her home on East 65th Street. And Eleanor Roosevelt seemed to Frances Perkins very lonely at that time. Here she was, and none of her children were around. And she wanted to talk about her finances. And Frances was the person she trusted. So the morning after she died, at 7.30 in the morning, I called Ms. Perkins, living at Telluride House, uh, on our intercom system. And I said, have you heard about Mrs. Roosevelt's death? She said, I've been, yes, I've been on the phone all morning. Oh, I don't know what time she started, but 7.30 st struck me as pretty early. Well, before I had anything to say, she said, you know, a lot of the world's gonna talk about how much Mrs. Roosevelt has done for the world. But I've known her long enough to know how much she did for herself. <laughs> and if I was, had the courage to write that book, it would be to give meaning to that reaction. And she said she recalled the time when, when she was the governor's wife up in her room in the attic, because they, of course, did not 
sleep together, with Franklin and Eleanor. Um, and she remembered Eleanor complaining she'd never had a house of her own. She was always in somebody else's, particularly her mother-in-law's house, both in Hyde Park and in New York. So, and I'm reaching a conclusion on this. She said, I, I'm really glad that there's gonna be a funeral like we did for the president in Hyde Park without a major funeral in New York. And um, when she came back from the funeral, she regaled us with what was going on. It was an extraordinary political event, Eleanor's funeral in Hyde Park. She said, I couldn't believe the number of young people standing along Route 9 as the hearse went by. She said, we really should have had the funeral at St. John the Divine. And I think in that period of four or five days of the nation grieving Mrs. Roosevelt, she fully accepted the phrase that Adelaide Stevens said that she was the first lady of the world. But that was a point she came to after having negotiated this long relationship from the early 1920s, really. Yeah, I heard it described as, as uh, Francis was a colleague and, and they worked as a friendship and, a, and a <coughs> I mean a colleague with Roosevelt, with Franklin. And uh, she didn't have the pillow talk that Eleanor had. And it was a different kind of relationship. And, and that might have been a little bit of friction sometimes too, because they came at him from different ways. Well, Fr Francis Perkins had access to Roosevelt on the most important issues right. of policy that the New Deal was all about. Eleanor had the inbox in which she was putting memos every day, things that she wanted the president to deal with, and he dealt with many of them. And, and many of the best things he did as president, he did under the pressure of, of Eleanor oh, Roosevelt. Yeah. <coughs> but the two women approached this major figure from very different angles, and that affected how they related to each other. Right. Thank you. Thank you very Good. much. Yeah, okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I came here tonight because last March I started to attend a little church on Capitol Hill that was under renovation <coughs> that I had last visited in the mid-90s. It's called St. Monica and St. James Episcopal Church. Mm. That is where I saw for the first time a picture of Francis Perkins, but it wasn't until tonight that I understood her legacy and why her image is in the parish hall. I'm curious to know if there are other places where she is being commemorated uh, as fully as you have commemorated her life and legacy in this film. It's well, been a real education and I'm deeply appreciative oh, well, for thank it. You. Thank and you. I thank you. There There are two wonderful books. Kristen Downey had a book recently in the last few years, but then there's a, a larger book, older book, by George Martin, who's in the film. It's out of print, but you can still get it on Amazon. It's called Madam Secretary, about her. Those two books have detail I could never get in the film. You know, great detail. I think uh, we need a statue or a monument of some sort. She, w she was one of the people considered to be on the money. You know, I think Harriet Tubman. She was on the money, all right. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I really think um, some kind of uh, monument that is um, right. of, of the, of, uh, along the lines of Mary McLeod Bethune's yeah, yeah. Uh, monument or Carter G. Woodson's uh, because they come to mind immediately. So that was one thing I wanted to mention and say, and I thought your daughter and your wife had lovely voices. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to um, ask, and then I'll take my seat, is about uh, what happened to her husband and her daughter and uh, well, her, her final days. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, her daughter lived beyond her, her, you know, the end of her life, but her husband died, what, in fi early 50s? 53. 53, and he went in and out of institutions, and then he ended up at the, at the home in Maine, I think at the very end, and he stayed in Maine. And uh, they had, I, you know, they had a, I, I went through a lot of their letters uh, at Columbia, which is at Columbia University, and they had a, um, you know, a really loving relationship, and I think it probably got more that way towards the end. It was that way at the beginning, but in the middle, there was this problem with this disease, and for people of the time, they just thought this person was, you know, was 
self-centered or, or crazy or something. You know, they didn't understand the disease. And so I think she really had a problem with that through the years. But she visited him regularly and kept in touch with him constantly. And she supported him the whole time by working. So, but he died, yeah, he died 13 years before her. Let me add a couple things on, the, on your first question. Uh, the Episcopal Church has recognized her. She, they now have a feast day, mm -hmm. uh, which coincides, I think, with her death date. Yeah, she's a saint. <coughs> she's a saint. Episcopal and her saint. church in Newcastle uh, has a beautiful icon portrait of her and she is a holy woman. And she made great fame a few years ago. The Episcopalian Church has got a March Madness, only they call it Lent, Lent Madness. <laughs> and people vote on who should be get the Golden Globe, the Golden Halo Award. Um, and in the year Francis got it, she beat out Bishop Tutu oh, oh. and um, I didn't know that. Mandela. <clears throat> Uh, so th these were votes from all over the world. So I think, and, and I would say about the, the Episcopal Church, there's a new book that's just come out by Don Mitchell that takes three theological sermons which she gave after she left Secretary of Labor. And it's, if, you, if you read David Brooks's book on character and what he says about Francis Perkins, which is much more complete than we got tonight, uh, she was a very serious, um, woman of the church. Three weekends a month she would go, down, go to New York to spend with Paul. On the fourth she would go to an Episcopal retreat in the Catoctin Mountains. No talking, just prayer. And, and this, was, this was her pattern. And, and she was very lonely. But she, she embraced the church. And, and one key point, and it, it's, it's in the film, talking about her congregational background with the individual being responsible. And if you're an alcoholic, that's your, that's your failure. Um, the Episcopal Church, as she understood it, from the Church of England, had the responsibility for everybody in the community, from the village idiot to the old people. And her comprehensive vision of us as a national family with a responsibility for everybody came not from her congregational roots, but from her Episcopal roots. And the other person that did the same thing was Henry Wallace, who came out of a Methodist background in Iowa, where his grandfather was a Methodist, major Methodist minister. And he became a high Episcopalian. And the two of them were each other's best friends on the cabinet. And I had the good fortune as a, my mid-20s to convene a seminar between the two of them at Telluride House for two days uh, and watch the the clear rapport between these these two folks. She also had it with Roosevelt, that connection, right? Oh yeah, the, the both the, Roosevelts were were, were Pacific Pacific Islands, yeah. but they they inherited it. She and yeah, Wallace. Well, that's true. They inherited were a lot. <laughs> were converts, which that's also true. often means you're much more strong in those. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Before I ask Christopher this question, I want to point out my first prediction, Mike. This will be up for an Emmy when oh, it comes well, on thank TV. You. Wow. I think so because it hits the right people, well, the, the industry, yeah. and. Uh, you know, can I say, when we interviewed Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Amy Klobuchar three years ago, we had no idea they'd have this visibility. So I have good timing for once. <laughs> but, but this is going to hit a lot of the female voters yeah, yeah. in the industry. And it's never had something like this on television before. Oh, thank you. This will be on March 1st on PBS to begin the Women's History Month and the celebration of 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Yeah. Okay, now, Chris, a question, a personal question. Yeah. In the 30s, the King and Queen of England came over to Hyde Park. This, you were at, worked at Hyde Park. You knew the history. 1939. And I was wondering if maybe Eleanor and Franklin invited Francis over to show what in the United States we could do with women. And this is the first, I mean, it, you know, Queen Victoria and others, they, they're used to that in England. But in the United States, this is the first time that we've had something. Do you know if there was any interaction? Do you know? 
I think it had more to do with the, with the impending war. Of, uh, but do you know on. whether Frances was at the Hyde Park hot dog? No, I don't know. Dog I don't know. I, no, don't. I, don't I don't think she was. Oh. The, I, th I think I've seen some film of it. And we couldn't find her in there. Yeah, the hot dog picnic. Right? I think it was really a focus on King, King George and Queen Elizabeth. And uh, they were determined, because this is the first time since the revolution yes. we'd had any of the royal family over in their capacity right. as royals. So this, this was regarded as a political risk for Franklin Roosevelt to take. So as they talked about it, and Mackenzie King, by the way, in Canada, recommended that when they were coming over to Canada, President Roosevelt should have them come. It was in June of 39, September of 39 being when Hitler moves into Poland. So it's really the very, the very end, and I think, I think you're right. It, it, the whole focus was really on what was happening in Europe and that we wanted to show a special relationship. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, and an interesting sidelight is that the film you see of her in the Senate speaking or in Congress, um, that's not American film. <laughs> it was really hard to find. It's English film, it's, it's British pathé. And it's because it was when the king and queen came, they brought filmmakers and they filmed Congress, and she happened to be there. That's the only one I got. One it. slightly amusing you can't part find of, that of, the, of the picnic <clears throat> was that Roosevelt, of course, his, his empowerment as a person was driving his car. Yeah. And he had cars in Warm Springs and cars in Hyde Park. And he insisted on taking the queen up to Top Cottage for this picnic, up the back road, which up, went through Val Kill and up. And she was terrified. <laughs> and she said at the end she would not drive with that man <laughs> again. But the part that was, of course, they'd never had hot dogs before. Yeah, and the good. queen <laughs> found it very hard to get her mouth around a hot dog. So there, was other, there were other goodies that she could eat. But, um, and there were a lot of people upset about that. It's just not the proper what they meal should, for right, a queen. Including yeah. Sarah. Yeah, yeah Sarah. Right. Won an opportunity <laughs> to uh, host royalty to give them hot dogs was... Yeah, it was crazy. But it was in a statement of America. Yeah. And by the way, the program that was put on was dominantly Native Americans. Yeah, it was. Uh, right. Showing that part of American history. And not in a, not in a critical way. It was, I know it was in a celebratory very, way. And it was in the yeah. Indian Native Americans themselves who performed. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. This side. <laughs> Yeah, the building is. Yeah. Mm. For her, yeah, the building is, right? Yeah. Which was done during the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Yep, that's right. I knew it was my lifetime, I just couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I understand. <laughs> Peter. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. It's thank you. magnificent. You're getting a pretty Especially good. Especially the presence through the board. I mean, the work you must have done to it came, came from, like I said yesterday, you know, it's 37, it came from 37 hours of lectures at Cornell. We went through all the lectures, eight years of it. And somebody had the presence of mind while she's teaching to put a reel-to-reel -reel recorder there and grab all those lectures. So that's what we used to, for her to tell her own story. So that's her voice in her 80s. Yeah, that's right. That's her older voice. Which is the way we knew her at Telluride House. Yeah. I was just going to say in terms of recognition, you might mention the Francis Perkins Center. Yeah, well, yeah, it, there, there's, that's another whole story, but the Francis Perkins Center is in uh, Newcastle, right? And it's, there's a, it, yeah, Damascotti. You can find it online anywhere. Just look up Francis Perkins Center and you'll find all you need to know. You have a question over there? Yes, hi, uh, thank you so much for this event tonight. I am actually a Maine native, and I oh. have vivid memories of learning about Maine history at different times in my education. Um, in fourth grade, we all had to do posters about different topics, and we had uh, similar you know, dioramas that we had to create in eighth grade, all these different segments. <laughs> And I was lucky enough to have a feminist professor from Bates College be my AP US uh, government and history professor in high school. So she really turned me on to public service. But I never heard about Frances Perkins till my senior year of college. Yeah. And I ended up, uh, I went back to Maine. I'm getting my master's in public affairs right now. And I worked on the Maine Women's Lobby Board for a while. And I'm just curious, you know, uh, you know someone mentioned the Frances Perkins Center, but have you thought about ways to connect with educational organizations or schools well, to really, you know, get yeah. this out there? Because I look at this room, 
there aren't many people my age or younger here, and I feel like there's a, a really important piece of American history that is so relevant to right now. Yeah. I'm just curious if you have any well, thoughts this, about how to get this out there. this reaches a lot of people, a lot more people than our name has ever reached, the film will. Because yeah. it's, it's open to 355 stations across the country, so wow. a lot of people are gonna see it. Yeah. But uh, we've talked to American Public Television about doing that. The problem is money, you know, you have to have mm. money to do all that, and they haven't been able to raise the money, but they might, you know, if there's enough interest in the film, we might be able to raise some money. I've heard you give mm -hmm. the estimate of how many people will hear this. Well, it's been, my other films have been 10 to 15 million people, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a pretty good audience for, but you know, a lot of these people, some of these people know who she is, but it's, I, we found it interesting because the first time we went to the house to do all that filming, mm -hmm. we were right in town. What, how far is Denver Scott? Five miles? Less than that. that Nobody in town knew who she was that we talked yeah. to. None of the waiters, none of the servers, nobody knew who she was. So yeah. I should say that Collier's Magazine in 1944 mm. had a long article uh, about her. It was called The Woman Nobody Knows. Mm -hmm. mm. This is while she's still Secretary of Labor. And it recounts her own observation about what she requested of the president-elect yeah. in February 1933. And the article said, if Francis Perkins is correct. What we have lived under in the last 12 years should not be the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal, it should be the Francis Perkins. So that was mm. a contemporary view yeah. of a popular magazine. Yeah. Yeah. I would say parenthetically that one of my experiences in, in retirement is being part of National History Day. Mm. Yeah, there's and I, somehow my name has gotten out for the kids who are doing Francis Perkins. Whatever the theme, people are finding <laughs> They can way. do Francis yeah. Perkins. Oh, great. And without, this is, this is precarious to say in such a big group as this, <laughs> the names of the girls, and they're all girls, <coughs> that are doing these projects are from the Middle East, South mm. Asia, yeah. China, um, mm. and somehow they see her in a very exciting light. Mm -hmm. So We're, I think there's no problem reaching young Americans, but it's the vehicle, and I think Mixed right. film is is going to be the major way in, and it's built on the books by George Martin and yeah, Kirsten right. Downey. They go to the books for more detail, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm, so um, we were at another screening yesterday in Portland, and uh, somebody asked me why she isn't better known. And part of the, the biggest part of the reason is she was really humble. She wanted nothing. It, it, she just didn't want it. She didn't want any publicity. Didn't care. They tried to get her to write an autobiography, and her auto, autobiography was the Roosevelt I knew and the whole book was about Roosevelt. Mm. She, she, she came up in a culture of, you talk about uh, one does this, one does that, not I did this, you know. Mm. She just was not a, a self-centered person and she didn't blow her own horn. So she could have, you know, we would know a lot more about her if she had done it herself, but she wouldn't do it. So. But it also, also and I think she'd be upset about this, actually. She'd like <laughs> the attention. She, she no, she'd love this. No, but she would like the attention, though. I, I don't really think she would. If you read her last, her letter of resignation, yeah. 9044. Oh, she's seven pages, single space typed, and it and it indicates what she and the president have accomplished uh, in 12 years. It it is an immortality. No, no, I agree. Project. She, she believed she wanted that. it to be known. Yeah. What it is she had accomplished. Yeah. yeah. I just don't think she would have. Well, it doesn't matter. We don't know. I, I, in a way, it's maybe good it's happening now instead of then. Yeah, I, I would I would say that part of the reason she lasted with Roosevelt for 12 years is that she didn't toot her own horn. I know. She, People that did that tend to not last as long. No, well, well no. It's an issue we've... Yeah, maybe. yeah, we, we, won't talk, we won't go there. All right, uh, yeah, another question. Hi, um, thank you for this. This is oh, a great movie and welcome. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm interested, I, well, so I understand the, um, the movie's focus on the Social Security Act in particular as one of the mm -hmm. most long-lasting and most significant and groundbreaking pieces of the New Deal. But of course, there were other pieces to it as sure. well. Sure. And I'm particularly interested in the collective bargaining piece, but mm -hmm. I know that that and all of the other pieces <coughs> were moving through Congress at the same time as sure. the big push you talk about for the Social Security Act. I guess I'm just wondering how much of a role she played in you know, all of those other pieces as well. Well, Robert Wagner was a big part of the, the whole labor uh, part of it, but she played a role in, um, in one way or another in almost everything. The problem is I have 56 minutes, <laughs> you know, and it's about 15 to 20 pages of type, that's all it is. It's not even a chapter in a book. So there's so many things. 
And the idea of a movie like this is to, to show the zeitgeist of the time and her spirit and get people interested. And then they can go to the books and get all the detail they want. And there's a couple of really good books. It has all that. George Martin's book and Chris, Kirsten Downey's book uh, are both really great for that. So, so you know, I had to kind of like, I have to make, you have, with biographies, you have to make it very narrow. It's about her life and what, you know, what she was doing and the major things she was doing. I mean, the, the whole uh, Fair Labor Standards Act should have been explored. I should have had another hour for that. But. There's just no. I would, I would say that she she introduced Harry Hopkins to Roosevelt. Yes, Arguably, she did. Harry Hopkins was the most right. influential advisor mm -hmm. across the board. Um, they were both and, social workers and both good friends. And and Harold Ickes was a social worker. Yep. So part of what was represented and there's a wonderful book on the subject of the social workers at the base of the whole New Deal program. But she was he trusted her on issues of personnel and. She had, he had her carry some very heavy water uh, in terms of personnel issues. So he, he trusted her as much as he trusted, I think, anybody. Yeah, I think so, too. I think we have a question over here. And oh, okay. I think after that, we have time for one more. Okay. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. One more. yeah. One more. In fairness, I think it's for. Oh, okay. Well, one of you. Go, Go ahead. Uh, the mine is really quick, but thank you very much. I'm a Mount Holyoke uh, graduate, oh, so good. Hey. and um, I think among the seven sisters, you know, we definitely yeah. know that uh, sure. about her. Um, I'm also a Francis Perkins scholar oh, um, wow. at the school, so wow. we kind of grew be, up. Be nice to me, please. Be nice. And to me. Um, <laughs> I'd love to support. I've talked to other uh, people, and we'd love to support the film and other screenings. So. Well, it's, we, it's going to be at Mount Holyoke, you know, on November, November, November right. 5th. November we 5th. did get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to go to Damaris Scott a number of times and, and the Francis Perkins Center. And it is a remarkable place. And in my discussions with the curators, I, I asked them, would it be possible, do you, or would that be advantageous that the Francis Perkins Center and the land be deeded to the U.S. government and become a National Historic Site under the Park Service. I do think that idea has some merit in terms of promoting the awareness of, of Francis Perkins and our history. Uh, the, the center struggles with constantly trying to get money to keep it operating, but of course with, with uh, those entanglements of a federal ownership, then you lose some control. Um, let me just offer one, I just wanted to share one other thing with you with respect to the film. And I would like your response to the idea of the National Historic Site, but um, I had the opportunity earlier in my life to serve as, as a career director of the, of the Office of Safety Standards at one of the agencies in the Department of Labor, the Mine Safety and Health Administration. And I led a group of very dedicated civil servants with many talents, health, uh, industrial hygienists and health scientists, to bring uh, better standards in the mining industry, whether it was black lung or protection from hearing loss, et cetera. And um, I came away from that experience realizing that the human condition is such that we're all flawed and there is always going to be a proclivity among those who would want to profit from the labor of other people to the, even to their suffering and their, and their poor health. So as much as this movie is inspiring to, uh, for what she accomplished, there's a lot more that still needs to be done. She would have said that too. Uh, let can me, can we we just, say about the, the, uh, the center. Okay. Uh, the Francis Perkins Center, which started 10 years ago, is in the late stages of actually purchasing the property from her grandson. And Peter Blaise Corcoran here is a member of our board. Uh, I've been chairman of that board for several years. And it will be in private hands. It is a national is historic true. landmark now. So it will be the center of our activities, which will be to per perpetuate the legacy. And, and we want it, the, the campus to be a place where we get people together to resolve issues. And one of her key stratagems was to get all the key stakeholders together in a committee, which she would chair. And so she knew what she wanted to come out of it. 
but she knew that she had to have all the key people in the same place to talk it through. And we'd like the center in the presence of her own home to, uh, to be a center for that. Can we take one last, just one last short question over here? Because she, she waited. And... Um, it, this isn't a question, actually. It was just something I thought folks might want to know, which is um, exactly how many people in the United States do know who Frances Perkins is. I'm working on a novel about Frances Perkins called Steadfast, oh, yeah. and sure. a friend who works That's... at a market research firm in um, outside New York City just donated a, a statistically significant survey of a representative sample of the U.S. Census population two weekends ago. And so as of two weekends ago, 6% of, of Americans yeah. can correctly identify who Francis Perkins is. Of the people who put f open text responses to who she was, two thought she was a man. And yep. one uh, said that she was uh, most well known for being Francis Perkins. <laughs> or, she started, or she started Perkins Restaurant, that's the other one. <laughs> Good. Well, I think that's it. I think Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks for coming. Good. Good. See, you didn't know what you did.